Croeso Canis i Bawb i Paned Planned Apranwyr, Eileen Dwi, Penaith Cymru Masnach Deg. Welcome everybody to Coffee, Climate and the Consumer. I'm Aileen, I'm the Head of Fairtrade Wales and I'm chairing today's event. We've organised this in partnership with the Welsh Muslim Cultural Foundation and Welcome, the Welsh Environmental Link, creating opportunities for Muslim engagement. Assalam alaikum. Our event today will be in the medium of English and I'd like to tell everyone that the event is also being recorded and we'll be publishing it online in the next few weeks. I'm, uh, I'm really excited about today to hear about the past, present and the future of coffee from our speakers. They will each speak and then we'll have a question and answer session that you can participate in. We'll be using Zoom webinar format for today's session. This means you should be able to see and hear from the speakers, but not from each other as attendees. If you move your mouse or your finger, if you're on a tablet to the bottom of the screen, you should be able to see a chat and a question and answer facility. You can type into the chat and the question and answer boxes and the Welsh Muslim Cultural Foundation and others here today are on hand to answer those questions. You can type a question at any point throughout today's session and we will answer them after all the panellists have spoken within the time limit allowed. On our live event page, you may have seen two options to join. One to join through Eventbrite and one is to open in Zoom. You will have a better experience if you choose to open in Zoom. We've done some thorough testing of this. Um, so Eventbrite settings do not work very well. You may not be able to see all the speakers if you are watching in Eventbrite. If you are having this problem, please just leave the event and rejoin through your email invitation and press open event and then open in Zoom. If you have any technical difficulties, feel free to use the chat function or email my colleague Caden on info at fairtradewales.org.uk. This email address will also be put in the chat box. I hope that you all know where your fire exits, your toilets and your refreshments are. Um, so that's not something that I should have to cover today. But we do have a housekeeping slide for a couple of notes for everyone to remember. So please be respectful today in our questions and in our chat. As I mentioned, please use the join through the Zoom instead of the join in um, Eventbrite option. Please use the question and answer box for questions. As you can see, there's a Q&A which is separate to the chat box. And if you want to say hello or chat to other attendees or panelists, please do so in the chat box. You're very welcome to do that. Again, if you have any technical issues, please use the chat box or email info at fairtradewales.org.uk. Uh, so today is International Coffee Day and we have an international set of speakers for you tonight coming across the time zones. I want to welcome Abdul Khemen, Lazarus and Scott. I'm going to ask you each to introduce yourself briefly and then we will pass on to Abdul Khemen who will take us through the history of coffee. So, if I can ask Abdul Khreman to introduce yourself. Well, good evening, uh, everyone. It's uh, such an honor and pleasure to be here. My name is uh, Abdul Rahman Malik. I'm currently based in New Haven, Connecticut, but today I'm coming to you from just outside Toronto, uh, Canada, from my from my parents' home. Um, I am a, a coffee enthusiast, an obsessive, have had a lifelong relationship with what I call the Mohammedan Dean. Um, I'm a journalist and educator and organizer currently um, teaching theology um, at uh, Yale Divinity School and uh, working on student facing um, leadership uh, programs, uh, but really wonderful uh, to be with all of you and especially with Lazarus and, and, and Gordon and the awesome people from Free Trade, Fair Trade Wales, um, the Welsh uh, Muslim community and welcome. Lazarus, can you introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thank you, Eileen. Um, 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lazarus Wambale. I am currently in Uganda and I work with uh, uh, coffee farmers, born and raised on a coffee farm. Um, so all my life, winter life has been on a coffee farm as a producer. And later as a coffee uh, lover, but basically for the early stages, uh, coffee was not really something we would consume as a, as a, as a beverage. So I'm trying to, to learn the, the dynamics of coffee. You understand it better than I do. But all in all, uh, I am very proud to, to be associated with uh, fair trade, but also to be associated with uh, the, um, today's, today's event. And I hope to learn, but also to give you some insights into what happens on the coffee farm. Glad to be here today. Thank you, Lazarus. And now Gordon is standing in for Scott, who um, was advertised as the speaker. So if Gordon, if you can explain who you are and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi. Good evening, everybody, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Gordon. I'm a director at Coulton Coffee Roasters based in South Wales, um, near Swansea. Um, we've been set up as a company uh, roasting coffee um, for about eight years now. Um, we're not a huge roastery, but we, we've, we're kind of evolving naturally, um, organically uh, as a business. And we, we currently roast quite a, quite a significant amount of coffee, about 100 tonnes a year, um, which is not insignificant. Um, but yeah, we've, 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 we're kind of growing organically and um, we love the business that we're in. Um, and we like to share our knowledge about roasting coffee with, with our customers and you know getting people to really understand coffee as a product um the last year with the, with the covid pandemic has been quite challenging um i think for everybody but uh, particularly for us because we had a wholesale arm to our business and obviously coffee shops and things had to close during that period um but when i do my talk later on i'll explain a bit of how we've evolved as a business and survived that pandemic so um it's great to meet you all and I look forward to speaking to you later yeah. Thank you very much. So that is a little taste of the things we'll be hearing about tonight. Um, yeah, it all sounds really exciting. And first of all, we're going to be hearing about the past of coffee. And I'm going to pass over to Abdul Kremen, who is going to be sharing with us. Thank you so much. Let me let me get this started. Uh, I hope all of you can see. Um, I hope all of you can see the screen. Um, first of all, I want I want to say that uh, I'm 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 really excited uh, to be here uh, with all of you, and I, I want to wish everyone an amazing International Coffee Day. Um, you know. It, it, we've often talked about it, and I know our friends in, in fair trade talk about it, um, that coffee being one of the most traded commodities uh, in, in the world. And I think each one of us who loves coffee, from folks like Lazarus, who, who were involved in the production of it but didn't know the taste of it, which is, which is interesting because that is such an experience, Lazarus, isn't it, of people all over the world who produce coffee. And, and there's an economic element to that, right? There's, there's a reason why often people who are producing coffee, particularly in international markets, don't get to taste it. And then folks like Gordon, you know, who are, who are taking the craft of coffee in our time to the next level, you know, and, and really bringing the, this, this incredible beverage and all the history and all the flavor and, and all the, the people, the human effort um, to, our, to our cups. I think it's just remarkable. So it's, a, it's, such, it's a wonderful to be part of this, of this, um, of this ecosystem, but I want to take you over the next 17 and a half minutes. Uh, I want to take you back. I want to take us really to the origins, because I think in the origins of coffee and understanding that story better, we really begin to understand why coffee has arguably been the most potent beverage ever known to the human being, other than water, the source of life itself. This is a beverage which literally changed every geography it went to. 
literally change, sometimes change the geography itself, certainly change the culture, change the economics, even change the, change the politics. There's something in coffee. There's something potent beyond caffeine, I would say, in coffee that, that really uh, begs us together as coffee lovers and people who are interested in coffee climate and the consumer to, um, to, explore, to explore further. And so we begin, we begin sort of at the, at the beginning. And, you know, I, uh, I, I'll, I'll digress for just, uh, just a moment because, you know, my family comes from South Asia. My father was born in British India um, in the Punjab. And in 1947, our family during the partition, the Great Partition came to what is now known as Pakistan. My mother's family was also from the Indian side of what became the Indian side of Punjab, rather, and came to, um, came to Pakistan. And you know, one thing we know about South Asians, at least uh, at least stereotypically, isn't it, is that we love chai. We love tea. Tea in the morning, tea in the afternoon, tea in the evening, tea at midnight. Uh, you know, to this day, my my parents, who are who are both, uh, thank God, in their in their seventies. You know, I'll if I when I'm visiting here in Toronto, which I haven't for almost two years, it's, so it's nice to be back home. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll hear rustling at, at like 3 a.m. And, uh, and, you know, I'll kind of bleary-eyed come downstairs. What's, what's the racket? And there's my dad making a cup of chai, making a cup of tea, because it's always time for tea. Tea for us was the home beverage. But growing up, coffee was the social beverage. Mm -hmm. It was Sundays coming home from the mosque, Sunday school, where we'd spent the day learning the Quran, reading texts, sitting with our, our spiritual teachers. And on the way home, my mom and dad would take us all to Mr. Donut. And at Mr. Donut, we'd, get, we'd have donuts and coffee. And to have coffee for me as a child was, was, was to do something terribly adult. And, you know, we'd sit at those old Formica tables Gordon, you know those kind of old tables from the old cafes, right? You sit at those formica tables and you and you have conversations about the world. How is your week? What's going on? What's, and there's something about coffee. There's something about that act of drinking it. Fast forward to my university years and the first Starbucks opens. I'm going to, it's the only time I'm going to mention that name in this entire presentation, I promise you, uh, independent coffee connoisseurs like us. I, I stepped into that behemoth, what would become that behemoth of a, of a, of a coffee franchise, first store in, 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 in Toronto. And there was this story on the wall about Kaldi, the goat herder from Ethiopia and how it was because his goats were eating the red coffee beans and then hopping around and dancing like mad that the properties of coffee were found. So the, the mythology of Kaldi stayed in my mind, but I didn't read much else on the walls of that behemoth franchise, Coffee Purveyor. And I came across, you know, in those years and before, um, articles, uh, little tracts, that would often refer to coffee as the wine of Islam. And I was like, you know, Muslims sometimes have a, have a, have a, maybe you'll agree with me, Omar, you know, sometimes Muslims, Muslims have a sense of um, overstating their importance in the world. You know, we all want to be important faith communities. We all want to be great civilizations. We are. But I was like, coffee, the wine of Islam, and I would read these tracts, and they would talk about Sufis and, and coffee and trade. I'm like, I, I don't know about this. But I became intrigued. And so throughout my university years, I started, you know, before the days of Google, started looking through encyclopedias and trying to find information um, and some kind of um, verification for these claims. And it wasn't until... I was in the holy city of, of Medina, the city, which is the city of the prophet and the resting place of the prophet Muhammad. And I was with a, with a teacher there during the holy month of Ramadan. And he made us coffee from the Yemen. And when he, after he made the coffee, he says, let us say a prayer. Let us say the prayer of coffee. And I said, Sheikh, is this a prayer that you wrote? He says, no. He says, this is an ancient prayer. And this is the prayer that you're seeing on your screen now. It's called the Fatiha of Coffee. And it's written by Al-Habib Al-Imam Ahmed bin Muhammad Al-Mahdar from the Valley of Hadramaut in the Yemen. 
And it's a beautiful prayer. It says that we recite the opening chapter of the Quran uh, in honor of the scholars of, uh, of the coffee, bunia, which can mean brown, or which also can be the coffee that comes from the, the bean and the family of, uh, of, the, uh, of the prophet. And those who are the elect and closest to God and those who are the mystics and, and those who prepared this beverage and the men and women of faith in this beautiful prayer, which you invoke God's blessings on all those who have been involved in making this bean, to, to producing this bean for you, for creating this beverage for you. You ask God uh, that, oh, give us freedom from debt. Oh, God, give us freedom from the travails of this world. Give us blessing through, uh, through this act of drinking what? Coffee? And I said, well, this is a very extensive prayer, Shaykh, said to my teacher. And he says, oh, this is just the, this is just the, the short prayer of coffee. I said, they're longer prayers? He said, some, some of them go four or five pages. And so I was, I, was, I was blown away. And so I started this journey again, anew. And I came across this word, which is used by the early historians, Arabic speaking and writing historians of coffee. And one of the great early historians of coffee was a man by the name of Ibn Abdul Ghaffar. And he talked about this idea of coffee be having, that when one, when one drinks coffee, one has what is known as markaha, markaha. And markaha is a very unique term, which is not found as far as I know, and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to be corrected by those who are attending and maybe scholars of the Arabic language. But I have spoken to folks and they're like, this term doesn't exist outside of coffee. And it's a specific term in the Arabic language, which means this feeling of sprightliness and the state of mental well-being when one has a beautiful cup of coffee. I mean, it's like a terminology is created, a lexicon is created for the experience of coffee itself. There's something going on here, I said to myself, and of course there was. Because we know between the, somewhere between the 9th and 14th centuries, coffee made its way over from its origin place, modern day Ethiopia, to the Yemen. And in the Yemen, through a number of spiritual teachers and masters and spiritual communities, coffee found a home that became part of ritual. First, the beans were, 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 were eaten. And anyone who's eaten a coffee bean known, there's an astringency to it, isn't it? There's a dryness to it when you have the, when you have the coffee bean. But they would have this dry fruit and they would feel the effects of the caffeine and they would be able to stay and do their devotions all night. But then they decided to take the skin off the bean, put the bean aside, but to boil the coffee skins. Gahwa al qishr or Gahwa al gishr as the Yemenis say. We know it now as kaskara, don't we, Gordon? The, the dried coffee fruit that it, you know, that's the origin of coffee. Coffee was first brewed and used by its fruit, not by its bean. And then comes the process by which the bean is first roasted to extract the flavor, then ground, then boiled. And the character that is often associated with this is a man by the name of Ali ibn Umar al-Shadali, who, who is the head of a Sufi order. In, in, in the Yemen. And it became, uh, a, a, amongst the followers and, and members of this Sufi order, it became natural for them to use coffee literally as the social beverage. During this time period, coffee now becomes cultivated for the first time formally in farms, in terraces. And let me show you some incredible pictures. This is from the Yemen, from uh, uh, overlooking a valley. This is a town where coffee is produced. My dear friend and beloved brother, Mukhtar al-Khanshali, the founder of Port of Mocha Coffee in, in California, has worked and lived in this particular town, and he took this picture. What lies beneath this town? And Yemen, is, as some of you will know, you know, I, unfortunately, today is associated with war and difficulty and conflict. Yemen is the one of the first places in the world where, where tall buildings, skyscrapers were built, multi-story buildings were built. These are ancient buildings, thousands of years old. And look at this valley. Look at that verdant valley of coffee below that town above. There is the town that we saw the picture before. And now look underneath. Terraced. 
terraced valleys of coffee. The European travelers, when they first came, said that as far as the eye could see, there were terraces of lush green filled with coffee trees. This is where coffee it begins to be cultivated. This is where coffee is picked. This is where coffee has begun to be processed. And this is where coffee first gains popularity. Now, there's never a good Muslim story without a good fatwa. We all know that. And so, you know, by the time we get into the late 1400s, early 1500s, Yemenis who are known as being a trading population, a trading people, they are carrying coffee with them right across the Arabian Peninsula. They carry it with them because it has become part of their culture. It no longer is just the Sufis. It now spreads into the communities, the societies uh, around these incredible, incredible Sufi orders. And so coffee starts to make its way across the Arabian Peninsula. And it's in Mecca in 1511 that we have the first case of a fatwa, a religious ruling against coffee. Why? Well, there's a man named Khair Bey. He belongs to the Mamluk dynasty. The Mamluk dynasty will fall in just a few years to the Ottomans. It's a dynasty on the, on the decline. Khair Bey has lots of problems in his city, including the selling of illicit alcohol, which of course is canonically banned within the Islamic tradition. And so one night after the evening prayer, he's walking out of the sacred mosque where the Kaaba is located, the center and the central house of worship in the Islamic faith. And he sees a group of Yemeni men and the histories tell us, he says he hears them speaking Yemeni Arabic and they are reciting praises on the prophet and praises to God, and they are roasting something and they are brewing something, they're drinking it. He's like, this is, a, this is a strange, intoxicating beverage. So he calls the great council of scholars and, and, and other potentates in Mecca and brings the two Persian physicians of the court and says, try this coffee. Try this thing that they call gahwa. And, and, and the physicians who are trying to ingratiate themselves to the court lie, as Ibn Abdul Ghaffar and the early historians of coffee tell us, they call them liars in the history because the, these, these, these physicians taste the coffee and they start to swoon and they say, I don't know where I am. I can't hold myself together. They fall. The, the, the Khair Bey says, look, you must sign a fatwa against this. It makes people intoxicated. And he sends the fatwa to Cairo to the Mamluk Sultan and says, look, I found, the, I found this, this dastardly beverage. And, this, and, and we must ban it. Well, little did he know that by the time the fatwa has arrived in Cairo, coffee is being drunk in the court of the Mamluk Sultan himself. Coffee has become so popular because they know this is a Yemeni beverage. They know the traders are drinking it. It's being drunk in the, in the alleyways of Cairo by the students from the Yemen who bring coffee with them to the Al-Azhar, one of the great and earliest universities known to humanity. And they, coffee is being served to other students. Khair Bey is deposed of his position. He's brought to Cairo and he's literally drawn and quartered. He suffers a terrible death. The two Persian physicians are also called to Cairo, but they're killed by highway robbers on the way there. And the sheikh who signed the fatwa against coffee dies an untimely death. Um, if, I was, um, if I had a macabre sense of humor, I would say um, coffee's God's beverage. Don't mess with it. But I don't have a macabre sense of humor, so I leave that with the, leave that, leave it with you with that. You know, coffee has this incredible history, and one of the places where coffee is first cultivated outside of the Yemen um, is um, is India. When the Ottoman Empire arose, and I'm looking at the time, Elena. I know I have about eight minutes, I think. But but you let me know. You let me know. Just feel free to be rudely interrupt me. Rudely interrupt me if you will. Um, when the Ottomans took over the coffee trade, they realized it was lucrative because by the time coffee reaches Cairo, it's soon the first coffee house opens in Damascus. And then Damascus, Aleppo, Mosul, Baghdad, uh, the Cairo, the great cities of the Levant, the great cities of trade, the great cities of antiquity all have coffee shops. And so as people travel, and you remember the Indian Ocean, we often forget the Indian Ocean is this remarkable, remarkable highway, isn't it? Where people are traveling, right? They're traveling to the Arab world. They're, they're traveling up to the Bay of Bengal. They're coming down the East Coast of Africa where, where, where Lazarus's 
where Lazarus is from, and they're going across to India. And so one of these people is known as Baba Budan, a poor Sufi mystic who loves coffee. And so against Ottoman law, which by death punishes anyone taking live coffee beans out of the Yemen, he tapes seven of them to his chest, asks Allah's forgiveness, asks God's forgiveness, and takes them to India. And to this day, the grave of Baba Budan is celebrated by people drinking coffee outside it. India produces beautiful coffee. And in fact, in South India, coffee is even more popular than tea. And that's where Baba Budan goes and, and these seven seeds become part of the history of coffee. You know, the truth is coffee becomes global very quickly. And I have a, I have a kind of a saying that I could as I share with you. If, if Ethiopia was where coffee had its, had its origin, it's the place that God chose in all of creation that coffee would, would erupt and emerge from the ground, then Yemen is where coffee found its soul where the true purpose of coffee as a devotional beverage and a social beverage was revealed. But it's in Ottoman Constantinople, it's in Istanbul of the Ottomans that coffee becomes an art form. And it's the rise of the coffee house. It's the rise of this. And look at this picture. I wanna look at it very closely. In one corner, you see people talking and conversing. In another corner, they're playing backgammon and chess. In another corner, there's musicians. In another corner, there's storytellers. There's scholars who are, who are, who are discussing religious, uh, religious tracts. There are those who are coming to give fealty and allegiance to the, to the noble people. There are poor, there are rich. And in the corner, right at the top right, you'll, you'll see that person, the Kavechi Basha, the first barista. The power of the barista in the Ottoman coffee house. That Kavechi Basha is the literally Kavechi Basha, the Pasha of coffee, right? The Pasha of making coffee, the master of making coffee. And that Kavechi Basha becomes so powerful in the Ottoman state that Kavechi Basha's ride to being ministers in the Ottoman Sultanate. They become ministers of the Sultan, of the Khalifa, of the emperor himself such as the power of the Kavechi Basha. But the, in the Ottoman coffee house, now we have for the first time a social institution, a social institution where hospitality can be expressed. Remember, this is a time when, when taverns are illegal. They're speakeasies within the Muslim world and around the world, actually, where restaurants and the idea of, of going someplace to have food is still fairly nascent. It actually hardly exists. People interact at the masjid, at the mosque, at the madrasa, at the school, at the markaz, uh, which is the bazaar. They meet in their houses because houses are designed for meeting. But in the, uh, in the Ottoman Istanbul and in the early coffee houses, as, 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 as um, uh, Ralph uh, Hatton tells us in his book, Coffee and Coffee Houses, the coffee house was in birth and development a very Muslim institution, a place where hospitality, craft and artistry came together, where people of different classes, one of the things that the European travelers who went to the coffee houses of the Levant and of Iraq and elsewhere, some of them were horrified. They said that there's poor people who work on the street during the day and they're sitting next to the rich people in their fine clothes and they're all having coffee. He says, what is this? This is a, they, Some of them said this was obscene because they were coming from a class-filled European environment. In the last few moments I have left, I want you to look at this map because it begins to tell us the story that our friends at Fair Trade Wales and our activists like Lazarus within the coffee community are telling us today. Because coffee very quickly becomes a major economic, um, an economic factor. So it's the Dutch, the Dutch East India Company, who first of all steals the coffee beans, taking them to Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and later on to where? To Java, Mocha, Java, <laughs> there's a connection. And they literally take it from the port of Mocha, which was the port where coffee was distributed by the Ottoman state. And they take it to Java. And they find in that volcanic soil of Indonesia, a home for coffee. The French steal the coffee bean and take it to Reunion Island, one of the places where specialty coffee now comes from. Reunion Island coffee is, is very expensive and very lovely. 
but they also take a plant in 1616 to France where they grow it in the botanical gardens. And eventually that plant is given as a gift to King Louis in France who gives it to a Catholic trader and that Catholic trader takes that, takes that plant to where? The island of Martinique. And in the island of Martinique, coffee spreads to Hispaniola, modern day Dominican Republic and Haiti. The, the Portuguese get involved in the action and they take it from India, from Goa, where coffee is being, <laughs> being grown to Brazil. Eventually it arrives in the American, uh, with, in connection with American empire. And in the mid 1800s, Hawaii becomes a recipient of plants. It's a remarkable thing. It's a remarkable journey. And yet it's also a journey filled with pain and, and the history of colonization and empire. Some of us know that the revolutionaries in Haiti were people who were influenced by the terrible conditions that the French had in the coffee plantations in Hispaniola and modern day Haiti. We know that enslaved labor was used to produce this cash crop, not dissimilar to cacao, not dissimilar from sugar. And yet from Ethiopia and the Yemen, coffee also travels culturally as a cultural force that wherever it goes, however it gets there, it becomes remarkable. Last two minutes, Eileen. In 1600, recognizing that coffee has now spread to Europe in places like Florence and Venice. Coffee is being drunk because there's trade. Don't forget the Mediterranean is also like a highway, isn't it? It's a highway between North Africa and, 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 uh, and what we would call Southern Europe. It's a, between the Levant and, and, the, and the gateway to the Atlantic Ocean. So Pope Clement is brought a petition from the bishops of Italy and they say, this is the devil's beverage. You know, God gave Jesus wine, they said, but they gave Muhammad the dark, evil devil's cup. We must condemn it. Pope was smart. Pope had a drink. He liked it. He says, this devil's drink is so, so delicious. We should cheat the devil and baptize it. In 1600, the Pope gave permission to Christians to sell and to trade coffee. I'll end up in London, city of, that, I, that I lived in for almost 15 years. Um, if Istanbul was where coffee became an art form, then I would say that London is where coffee became a lifestyle. At its height, London had one coffee house for every 140 citizens over 3,500 coffee houses in London alone, overshadowing the pubs. These days, if you go to London or anywhere in England and see a Turk's head, you should probably know there was a coffee house there because it was the a symbol of the Turk which represented coffee because it was seen as an Ottoman beverage. And it was Pasqua Rosé, the manservant of an English merchant in 1652, who in London's Corn Hill, off of the Corn Hill, set up the first the first, uh, the first coffee house, set up that first coffee house. This is a picture of the city of London at the height of the coffee craze. This is, this is literally a few hundred feet. Look at how many coffee houses there are. There was a coffee house dedicated, the Athenium dedicated to science. There was a coffee house dedicated to poetry. There were coffee houses dedicated to politics. They became salons not for the drunk, but those who are drunk on conversation and knowledge and poetry and sharing information. Lloyd's of London starts as a coffee house and becomes an insurance um, enterprise and then later on uh, a bank. The, the first newspapers are established in coffee houses. Coffee houses are known by people as penny universities, places where you can have as much coffee for a penny and learn how to read and write. Eileen, all to say, that the history of coffee is a remarkable history, but it goes right back to this picture. It goes right back to people sitting together, having a beverage, having 
listening to a story as, as these coffee goers are listening to the stories in old Damascus, right? The storytellers of Damascus and the beautiful coffee that they share. And what's the point of it all? The poet said it best. Ah, coffee's just, you know, why do we need sugar in our coffee? It's em enough that the conversation in the company is sweet. It's not the coffee that we want. Although I, I, I have to say, the coffee's pretty good when it's good. You get it from Gordon, you know? But what does, what do, what is coffee a means to? It's a pretext for sohbat, for friendship. And if anything, I think coffee has brought us together on International Coffee Day in, 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 in friendship. And also with a deep concern that those women and men, those communities who are producing our coffee uh, should not only be receiving fair wages, should be receiving just wages. And that the coffee industry itself needs to, needs to um, really uh, fight against exploitation. And that's, I know, what we're going to be hearing about from our from our friends. Thank you for being so patient with me. Uh, and I look forward to the conversation. I look forward to hearing from Lazarus and, and Gordon. Y'all can vow, Abdul Rahman. That was wonderful. Yeah, I think we've had some lovely messages in the chat as well. That's absolutely brilliant. I think what you spoke about, coffee being made part of ritual, I thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. and interesting to hear about how how we treat coffee today and, and and the ritual of coffee today is quite interesting. So we're going to travel, we're going to do our biggest time zone leap now and travel from Canada all the way to Uganda. And we're going to hear from Lazarus, who is going to talk to us about coffee now and what might happen to coffee in the future as well. Well, uh, I must say, uh, I'm really mesmerized at uh, what coffee is. And I, I guess probably this, I did not. I'm very happy that International Coffee Day has found me here today to learn. And Yes, like Abdurrahman has said, the coffee farmers do need the just wage and not only the fair wage. Yes, so uh, my name is Lazarus Wambal. I work with uh, um, Renzori Sustainable Trade Center, but I support farmer cooperatives within Uganda. And today I am here in. Uh, the seat of uh, Vuka Cooperative, which is found in Uganda, and it's between the, the border of uh, um, Uganda and Democratic Republic of Congo. We are on, we are located on Mount Renzori, uh, and Mount Renzori, I think, uh, is uh, well known for its uh, being snow capped yet it's just a few meters from the equator. What a marvel. However, this is a marvel that we as producers are trying to protect and is being threatened by climate change. We have produced one of the best coffees in the world. And I think if you would probably observe from the next slide, you realize that, uh, um, next slide, uh, you realize that yes, so uh, when you look at uh, uh, our next slide, you realize that for for example, like uh, the pre the precurrent speaker has just mentioned, uh, Uganda as a country also believes and we know that coffee. The one we have in Uganda today uh, most likely came from Ethiopia highlands, but we also think probably it could have uh, uh, come from Malawi. So the origin of coffee in Uganda is quite, has a link with uh, Abdurrahman's uh, 
Now, in Uganda, currently, we have two types of uh, coffee that are being grown. That's Robusta and Arabica. And Robusta is the most, most grown. And basically, in terms of ratios, it's uh, like four to one. So uh, uh, Robusta takes uh, four and Arabica is one. Probably, if you would look at the map, you would really see where the yellow lines are. And the green and uh, the blue lines are, and that would show you how uh, the growing of coffee is distributed within Uganda. Uganda, generally, if you would put it at the international perspective, is uh, Africa's second largest coffee producer, uh, falling behind Ethiopia, but also globally, we stand at the seventh position. Currently, about uh, 1.7 million smallholder coffee farmers grow coffee, but on very small land parcels. And this in its own sense has a lot to do with today's discussion about climate change, as we will be seeing later. Generally speaking, uh, as a country, we are currently lying between three to four million bags of coffee. So Uganda is one place you'd go to in case you needed coffee. And at the moment we are using a lot of, we are, we are uh, actually the, the trade, that the trade of coffee here is more free trade. So you can come in anytime and bargain for the price, for the quality you, you want. And at the moment, coffee contributes 18% of uh, the total exports for Uganda as a country and this, means a lot to us as Uganda in terms of uh, uh, foreign exchange. And it becomes a very important com commodity to us. Fortunately, uh, very little of this, less than 1% of what we produce is consumed here. So much of it goes to give energy to the world wherever it finds itself. Next. Yes, probably maybe if uh, you've not interfaced with uh, Robusta and the uh, Arabica coffee, this picture gives a little bit of a glimpse of what it is, but the experience is more wonderful if you came down on the farm and you saw the difference by yourself. Surely this would be a most wonderful experience as a consumer of coffee, but literally, that's how the two crops look like. Uh, variations are there in terms of the growth and the stature of the plant, but also in terms of the caffeine content. Robusta has more caffeine content compared to Arabica, but Arabica has more volatile flavors compared to Robusta. Generally speaking, at the end of the day, it all makes a cup of coffee. Next. Next slide. Yes, uh, now, when we look at uh, uh, climate change, when I bring it to the perspective of what we as coffee producers are experiencing, generally over the years, we've experienced uh, a lot of changes and the observations are very clear from the farmer's perspective. These observations, for example, if I would look at like, uh, temperatures, we've seen an average increase in uh, temperature by 1.5. And this has resulted into the melting of the snow on the Rezori mountain. And this, for since the year 2016, we have seen a lot of uh, floods. And these floods have been associated to the melting of the snow. And they've caused a lot of life uh, loss they've caused a lot of destruction of property, including coffee farms, because for example, for the case of Arabica, it requires high altitude. And so much of it is grown by the farmers who live on uh, the slopes of uh, the Renzori mountain, and those are the most affected. So probably if you've uh, taken a cup whose origin is from Uganda, it's a very high likelihood of this 
and probably elsewhere in uh, Uganda also, for example, on the eastern side of Uganda, there's Mount Elgon, where also, again, coffees, uh, especially Arabicas, are grown. And we've seen a lot of death there from mudslides. A number of people dying. Government came in and actually even relocated some of the farmers. But this surely was not the best that they any human being would go through because there's a social bond that was broken, but climate change played its part, quite painful. We've also equally seen a change in the rainfall patterns. We've uh, seen years where the rain is much, we've seen years where the rain is less. Whereas Uganda experiences to a bimodal uh, season, uh, two rains, two rain seasons in a year, Sometimes now, currently as producers, we are not able to predict. Previously, we used to know between this month and this month is going to be a rain season. However, these days, sometimes the rain will come during the dry season. Sometimes it will not come during the rainy, what we expected to be the rainy season. So it's that complicated for the producer. However, he still has to make sure the cup of coffee comes to your table. And generally speaking, there's a lot of now seasonality changes. We've seen extreme weathers, like I had already mentioned, where rainfall that comes and results into mudslides, sweeping homes, sweeping people's farms. For example, the cooperative that I'm representing today, we, in the year 2019, December, lost 22 of our farmers. And quite painful, but that's the reality we are experiencing as a result of climate change. And as farmers, we ordinarily understand that the weather patterns have changed. We understand that the rainfall patterns have changed. We appreciate that there is a lot of heat uh, uh, being experienced. However, this now technically is what uh, probably uh, us as technical people understand as climate change, but the farmer indeed does appreciate that there is this change that has happened. Next slide. And so what is uh, this coffee producer experiencing? For example, like I had already mentioned earlier, the coffee production in Uganda and in most areas is being produced by smallholder farmers. And indeed, there is evidence that climate change increases vulnerability of these smallholder farmers. Because on average, uh, a smallholder farmer, for example, for the case of Uganda, can only be able to produce 300 kilograms of coffee from an acre. And so if he lost half of that, probably he has lost half of the annual income. He has lost probably all his farm to the effects of climate change. And yes, we know that the causes of climate change are very clear, much of it being associated to the depletion of the ozone layer. That is as a result of production of carbon either being emitted by factories, but somehow, somewhere, the effect is being felt by those that probably contribute a very small percentage of that. So it becomes a responsibility of the entire human race to play a role because while the greenhouse gases are being produced elsewhere, the effect is being felt equally elsewhere. And so it's a responsibility for everyone that loves coffee, for everyone that loves humanity, that we take into account the effect of what we could be equally doing as producers, but also as consumers. What are we contributing to this? And generally for us as a cooperative, for example, last year uh, for, from the year 2016, 47 acres of uh, coffee farmlands have been lost to new pests that didn't exist. But because of climate change, these pests are starting to go to the higher altitude. These were pests that were actually affecting our, our robustas which are generally grown on lowlands that are or 
men, generally speaking, have high temperatures, but we are starting to see these pests attacking Arabicas that are grown on highlands where, generally speaking, the temperatures were not favorable. But because of the increase, sudden increase or rise in temperature, we start to see some of these pests attacking Arabica. So there is a threat that we all have to contribute to. We have a reason to fight. Next, please. Yes, to you as a consumer, surely if this trend continues, there is a possibility that we will see a sudden, sudden increase in coffee prices. So it does not only really affect the producer, the consumer. And I know uh, many of us depend on coffee and therefore no matter how much the price will be, surely someone will pay. And so this, we expect it to be the norm maybe if the trend continues because there, are, there, there is a high incidence of pests and diseases that are already affecting the plant. And because of this, now we are starting to see uh, more use of uh, uh, synthetic inputs. These are fertilizers to try and double the yield. But also we are starting to see some farmers run away from producing organic coffee to the use of uh, uh, pesticides to try and see if they can control. Because to us as producers, coffee is money because that's what we uh, sell to generate income, to pay school fees and put food on the table, but also uh, to, to be able to meet our social obligations. So this now again goes back to the consumer. Surely if there is going to be continued use of some of these inputs, there is a threat on the sustainability because usually this synthetic production never lasts long. So there can always be that that we most likely will face in future. However, we are still hopeful that together as uh, a society, together as human beings, there is a responsibility, there's something we can do to bring the wheels, turn them backwards of climate change. The next slide. Yes, so as uh, coffee farmers, we already appreciate that the weather patterns have changed, the climate has changed. What are we already doing? For example, as a cooperative, we've already established a uh, committee in our beds. You can see uh, these are some of our producers taking uh, tree seedlings because we know that once you plant trees, there's one stabilization effect of the soil. So the mudslides probably could reduce, but also we understand that as trees grow through the process of photosynthesis, they consume carbon dioxide and that contributes to the reduction of the greenhouse gas effect. But also there is a micro climate that is created that tries to stabilize if there was a, a high temperature rise, usually coffee that is grown under shade will survive a drought. And so these are all efforts that we are putting across. And some of this income we are getting as a result of uh, premiums that we get on an extra pay that we get on every kilogram of coffee. And so we are putting it back into uh, investing it into fighting climate effects of climate change. We have also engaged into radio talk shows to create awareness so that people understand that what is happening is not just a spirit attached effect, but it's an effect that is as a result of the act activities of us as producers, but maybe also as a result of effects of activities that are taking place elsewhere. However, as producers, we are being encouraged to take our own responsibility and do our part. For example, like uh, looking after trees and making sure we are reducing the use of uh, charcoal, we are reducing the use of uh, uh, firewood, we are managing and sustainably keeping our farms to reduce uh, of our cultivation, which in the end would contribute to production of greenhouse gas. So this generally is what 
or part of what we, the producers, are doing to contribute to reducing the effects of climate change onto the coffee sector, whose effects also spill to other enterprises. The next slide. Lazarus, just you, oh, you're on your conclusion, perfect. Just <laughs> Yes, yes, so yeah. So finally, uh, what are we uh, probably suggesting as producers? One, we are thinking as, uh, Organic certification, maybe uh, Rainforest Alliance and Fair Trade, all these sustainability certifications have an element to do with premiums, but also contributing to the environment. Premiums are being used deliberately to fight some of these. So if you buy, if you find a certified coffee, please know you're contributing, you're already contributing in some way. We are also saying there should be responsible consumption. For example, if there are more roasters, uh, buying sourcing directly from producers, there is a likelihood that this income could be translated to the producer. And so the producer could find a reason to care for the environment, but also for the coffee, but also to understand. Because in, the, in between there, there is a reduction of uh, uh, the loss in the message being translated from the consumer to the producer. But also we are saying there should be more investment into climate change advocacy campaigns to create more awareness so that the producers understand, but also the consumers should understand that the producers are already feeling the heat. And therefore it is a two way interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lazarus. That was really interesting and and very sobering and you know we've called our event uh you know the past the present and and the future and actually it's clear that you know climate impacts are not the future they're the present it, it's you know the climate impacts are happening already and i really like that you've put those three actions here that we need to be taking uh as well as coffee consumers because we do um create a lot of carbon in what we do um, finally, I'm going to pass to Gordon, who's going to talk, uh, coming back to Wales, and going to talk a little bit about coffee roasting and selling in Wales. Before we move on to questions and answers, remember you can put questions in the question box at any time. Thanks. Uh, good evening again, everybody. Um... Wow, what a hard act to follow with uh, with both Abdul Rahman and um, Lazarus. Amazing speeches, uh, amazing talks, incredible, very, very interesting. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the business that we have called Coal Town Coffee Roasters. We're based in South Wales. Um, we've been roasting coffee for about eight years. Um, we started getting into the coffee industry probably about 20 years ago with with, um, with a small cafe that we run and that was really our introduction to coffee um but since then we've, we've kind of evolved and we've developed a coffee roasting business um so what is coffee roasting all about um basically we take the the, the seed of the, of the fruit that um, lazarus produces in in uganda but also in other parts of the world and we convert that into what we know as coffee a beverage so the seed that is produced by by Lazarus is, is, is basically a seed designed by nature to reproduce um, and it has all the chemicals you know within it to reproduce and produce new coffee trees. When we roast the coffee we actually convert that chemistry into what we now know as coffee. So in its raw state as a, as a seed it basically if it, if it was analyzed it would have, contain about 200 chemicals. After we've roasted it it produces we've, we've created new chemical chemistry and it's somewhere in the order of about 1200 chemicals so that's that's where the chemical complexity comes in that's where all the aroma comes from and all the flavor in the coffee uh so roasting coffee is considered to be a bit of an art form also a bit of science mixed into it so what we what i'm going to talk about is is how we go through the roasting process um basically it's it's a like a big gas powered tumble dryer effectively where um we heat this drum up and the green coffee that we that we buy from the farms is actually roasted away in this drum and as it tumbles away in this drum uh the chemistry actually changes through different phases and the whole process takes about 12 to 15 minutes and during that stage lots of 
chemical bonds are taking place. Uh, chem some chemistry has been removed. Some chemistry has been added. And at the end of this process, we end up with what's known as coffee, which is what we grind and, and brew um, to create the beverage that everybody loves. Um, we are considered to be, we consider ourselves to be what's called a specialty coffee roaster. Um, this, this is a term that's a bit sort of misunderstood um, in various areas. Um, a lot of people tend to think that specialty coffee is adding whipped cream to it and some syrups to sweeten it up. It's not that at all. Specialty coffee is about using high grade coffees and, and, and having a relationship with the farmers um, to develop the product to make sure the quality is really good and actually getting the best quality um, coffee that we can that, that we can buy. Um, and we buy it and we trade directly with farmers around the world to, to have that really good close relationship. Therefore, cutting out sort of middlemen and keeping the keeping the price, um, the end price of the, the coffee relatively competitive, which means that we can feed that 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 benefit back to the farmers. So it's it's a better relationship, if you like, and and the farmers hopefully benefit a lot more than kind of more traditional commodity ways of trading coffee. Um, uh, we buy some coffee actually from from Mount Elgon. I think um, Lazarus mentioned Mount Elgon earlier. So some of the coffee that we're roasting at the moment is from from your region. Um, and we had a couple of couple of guys visit um, visit before the pandemic a few years ago. And I think they, they visited your 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 wash station in uh, Rewazori. Um So they know some. They've they've made some direct contacts and um, I think some lifetime lifetime friends. I think going forward. Um, so. What we're all about in terms of roasting coffee, we look, we're looking for the best co grade coffee that we can get. We're all about flavor. We're not so much interested in the caffeine content. So we just roast Arabica coffees. So we're interested in developing the really intense flavors and getting the best, best from the coffee. We're all about showcasing the, 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 um, the different qualities that coffees have from different growing regions. So Ugandan coffee will taste totally different to say Brazilian or Colombian coffees. And we really celebrate that that kind of uniqueness and that uh, that regional diversity that you get within the coffee industry. Um, so that's that's really what what kind of specialty coffee is all about, and that's what we really try to promote within the industry. Um, we're also proud to be uh, one of the first B Corp uh, B Corporation specialty coffee roasters in in the UK. Um, we were we were actually the first specialty coffee roastery in the UK to be certified, and that that brings with it a lot of um, commitments from us as a business. Uh, we have to commit to our community to make sure that we we share some of the profits of our business with our lo with our local community. Um, but also, we have a lot of environmental um, responsibilities as well. So we we we. we we've, we're committed year on year legally by the way it's actually a legal commitment written into the into the sort of the basis of the business um to actually reduce our environmental emissions reduce our waste and we, we we challenge ourselves every year to try and reduce this and it's it's actually monitored very closely uh for us to retain our b, b, b cop um status in that respect um I really like the term that um, that uh, Lazarus used just now, um, which kind of reinforces the trade kind of relationship. I think he used the term farm um, farm to cup as a trading as a trading method. We term it more like a sort of direct trade or a relationship coffee. Um, so we have really good relationships with our with our sort of farmer partners across the world, and we share that knowledge with them all the time. And it's it's a really fascinating business to be in um that's that's pretty much it really to be honest um keeping it short um i haven't got any slides to show you there was a bit of a breakdown in uh in in getting those slides launched but uh i hope that's given you a bit of an insight into what we do as coffee roasters and our kind of commitments to um to sustainability and and to the farmers that uh, supply us with with the product thank you very much jochen val gordon yeah it's, it's really Good to hear um, how things are working and the values that are very much at the front of um, Coal Town Coffee and kind of and and the the focus that you're having and having those relationships um, directly with the farmers. 
So we're going to move on to the question and answer session now. So we've got about 15 minutes for some various questions and answers. So please, if you have anything you would like to ask um, any of our panelists, then please do so. Um, checking all my notes where they've gone. Um, Towards the end of the session, we will also put links up, up to the websites um, of if you wish to find out any more or follow anything up. So there's a question here for Gordon. And it says, how has the Welsh public responded to a specialist roaster like Cold Town? Do you get grief for charging a fair price higher than the chain coffee places? Um, actually, no. Um, to be fair, um, we, we, as well as having the roaster, we, we also have a coffee shop uh, attached to it, um, which we've operated since we opened. And... We, we never get anybody anybody complaining about the the, the cost of the, in fact we keep we try to keep our cost as competitive as we can that that's fundamental we're in business but generally speaking the people love the fact that we're a b cop the, the, the first b cop specialty roastery in wales um it's been really well embraced and um customers just love it and it's 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 been a really good kind of promotional tool for our business as well um so, so we can actually push our our kind of brand, if you like, further afield because it's recognised not beyond the boundaries of Wales and uh, actually globally. So it's 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 been a really beneficial thing for us to be involved in, and it's a great community as well of people who have like-minded people. Thank you very much. I think also there's something interesting, Gordon, isn't there around. And, and, and I'd love to hear Lazarus's thoughts on this because I, I think there's something at least in the zeitgeist, right? Around the, around the precious barista and the specialty coffee and that, you know, there's the $6 cup of coffee or the six pound cup of coffee or something like that. And, and then when you think about it, you think that, you know, uh, you know, roaster like yourself and others who are engaging in beyond even fair trade. And I think this is an important question for all of us, including fair trade advocates, right? The fair trade price of coffee is good. It's better, but Starbucks pays the fair trade price for coffee. The truth is the fair trade price is really the absolute min minimum, right? That, that the price of coffee should go. The, the reality is, is that the, the price needs to be higher and commensurate to the amount of effort craft, science that Lazarus and growers and communities like him put into the final product, right? And, and so I think we also need to be careful, particularly in this space, is to say that fair trade is just the beginning, just trade is our goal. And, and in fact, what we want to do is, is get to the point where, where, where direct trade is really providing a premium because the product is a premium. We're charging six pounds of coffee sometimes because frankly, that's what, it's, that's what it's absolutely worth. And you know, in the United States, you have companies like Onyx Coffee, for instance, that I really wanna kind of lift up as an example of 100% transparency, literally transparency from the farm to the cup. If you go on the Onyx website and look at any of their coffees, they will give you the price point of how much they've paid at every step of the way, how much shipping cost per X amount of coffee, how much, how much, how much, so that you as a consumer know that, yeah, in the end, Onyx is making this much, but mm -hmm. they're making this much because they facilitated that much. And that the coffee producer who might've been making nary a pound on a, on, on, a, on a kilo of coffee is now making five or four or two. And what a transformational impact that has on has on has on communities in our respect um you know with the price that we pay for the coffee and the, the trade that we have with the farmers all that's kind of audited with us with bcop with with, with a legal commitment to that and that's audited every sort of two years with bcop and it's they, they literally go through our accounts in in fine to you know fine detail 
So there's no hiding anything. It's all transparent and, and it's audited by them. And typically, we we typically pay about 20% above um, fair trade prices for our coffee. So I'm just going to come in and talk about the fair trade prices. So um, there's a company very similar to the one you were talking about, Abdul Rahman, here called Tradecraft. And they have started to do that breakdown of every every stage and to make that more, more transparent with what they're doing. Um, the fair trade price it's a very it, like you said it is a minimum price fair trade suppliers are able to buy much higher than that and the price also goes along with the stock market so it's like that bottom out net of what that is what's happening in the fair trade movement at the moment is um really what's happening in wider society so the fair trade mark came in back in 1994 and in the uk the minimum wage came in in 1997 um, and what's happening now is we're seeing this move towards living wages and this concept of living wages. And that's also happening in the fair trade movement with these minimum, with these living prices that are starting to be starting to be put out there as actually originally, you know, 25 years ago, it was what is the price that will cover the cost of production? And mm. now it is actually you can't just cover the cost of production you need to be doing more than that you need people need to be able to save for emergencies people need to be able to provide things of their own so um that that is kind of what happens there i think it's really good to have those direct relationships i'm going to move on to another question um this is one for you lazarus so what are some examples of unsustainable coffee growing methods and their sustainable alternatives. Yeah, uh, thank you, Robbie. Uh, I think uh, one is um, the, the 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 commercial commercial coffee production has a. I think I can say that that's uh, the, the 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 first. Uh, the first step, whereas uh, smallholder production is a little complicated for the trader, it remains the sus most sustainable way of producing coffee. Because, for example, for the experience I've had with fair trade and organic certification, it's very hard for you to work with a commercial farmer on organic and fair trade because they will usually not see the reason to care, and so. Uh, if it's if the coffee you're consuming is being commercially produced, there is a likelihood that probably there is a forest that has been cut. Probably there is a, um, um, a whole production process that is contributing to all these uh, contributors of, of uh, climate change. So, whereas I think the most important thing is for you to demand for the origin of what you're consuming. If the consumer starts to demand for the origin, probably we'll even see the commercial farmers start to move into this. And they start to understand that what they are doing is a guest and is hurting the rest of the production system. Um, I think the other was uh, what, uh, what the world leaders can do to improve fairness in the coffee system and what can consumers do. I think generally speaking, it's about what we are stating today to say, can we look at a living wage? Can we look at, can we understand who the producer of what gives you the energy to produce what you're producing at your workplace is earning from what is giving you that energy? Not necessarily that they want to cheat you, but I think as a way of giving credit where it's due. Because most of the time, the farmer is not getting a good share of the income that is being made in this trade. And probably, yes, it seems to be good for the one who is making the income. But definitely at one point, I have with situations where farmers have cut their coffee plantations to do other crops. That's probably maybe could be something that is not tangible. But with the situation, for example, the situation we've seen in Brazil now, there are so many buyers that are running to Uganda. So maybe it's, it's very bad that our colleagues in Brazil are facing such a situation, but we can't also uh, take it for granted that probably someday 
such a situation could not happen, especially when now there's a lot of communication exchange, farmers can access information and so on, understand what is happening with the world market, how much a kilogram of coffee is being sold. Surely it's just a matter of time. So I think world leaders need to stand up. The consumers need to stand up for the producer. At the end of the day, it will be a win-win. When the producer is happy, the consumer will be happy and everybody will be happy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lazarus. Does Gordon or Abdul Rahman have something to add to that question at all? No. No. Fabulous. Uh, we have another question, and please do keep putting your questions in. We've got a few more minutes. This is for all of you. How do you, or what way do you suggest to make an excellent cup of coffee at home, and how do you drink it? So, Gordon, I'll go to you first. Okay, I don't think there, personally, I don't think there, there is any right or wrong way to make coffee at home, as long as you follow the process correctly, uh, and you brew your contact times and your weights and your, your, your ratios are correct, provided you, you follow the rules of that particular brew method, I think you can get a delicious cup of coffee, no matter how you brew it. Yeah, I, I would, I would sort of generally concur. I, I, I think there. I think that you know, common mistakes are using like like a, a water that's too hot, you know, yeah. um, for uh, that that kind of that kind of um, you know that's boiling water that scalds the coffee that kind of burns it that releases all the flavor and and stops all those amazing chemical processes that Gordon talked about from 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 actually taking place. But you know, anyone can really have a fairly straightforward and simple approach to coffee at home, a good pour over setup, a, um, uh, you know, um, a, a decent grinder and, uh, and, and having a scale um, will yeah. do wonders. And you'll see just as, as Gordon said, knowing that, Hey, take 250 grams of coffee to 16 grams of uh, 16, 16 grams of coffee, 250 grams of water. It's a good ratio to start with and just play with it. And I think what you'll find is that, you know, a brewing a slightly higher temperature, lower temperatures, you'll start to play with it. And, and you know what, I've often felt like, uh, and, and although I'm not a, uh, I'm not a wine drinker, um, uh, friends have often said that my obsession with coffee sort of veers along what a obsessive of wine might, might, might take in, but, but it's the same thing, isn't it? Ultimately, you're enjoying a beverage for the, for the, the qualities it has. And so that amazing coffee from the farms that Lazarus works with and the amazing producers that he works with i'm tasting like that's the beauty of coffee right the coffee from uganda i'm tasting uganda literally i am tasting the soil the blood the sweat the organics right these historic sometimes thousand year old coffee plantations and and plants i'm tasting all that history but i'm also tasting all that incredible work that has been put into, into crafting it, into drying the beans, into fermenting them properly, into husking them, into creating that. To, you know, I, I'm tasting all of that. That's why I'll pay extra for my coffee. That's why I'll go the extra mile because I know that I'm investing in an entire production line that kind of means something. And, 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 and I think getting some of our brew methods right is our way of saying thank you <laughs> and honoring our producers and saying that we are going to bring excellence. And, in Islamic spirituality, we have this idea of ihsan, of, of bringing excellence and craft to anything that we do. And you don't need to be a craftsperson. You don't need to be an artisan to do artisan coffee. You need to believe and, and, want, to, and want to extract the fullest flavor and joy from the, from, the, from, the, from the bean. And that's possible for all of us. And in a way, for me, that, you know, that's honoring the producer and I love to have coffees from all around the world because I feel I can taste Guatemala and I can taste Costa Rica, I can taste Uganda and I can taste Rwanda. And I know that certain coffees <laughs> from certain parts of the world have certain flavor profiles. And then there's the stuff that knocks your socks off. I want one a quick one, Eileen and Gordon. I think you'll appreciate this. I tasted a coffee from Aceh in Sumatra, Indonesia, that was called the Gayo wine. I had it first 
in Jakarta at an incredible coffee house roastery. And I remember tasting it. I've never tasted wine, but boy, this tasted like warm blueberry juice straight up. And it was the most unusual coffee. It had this kind of almost fermented uh, scent to it. And I remember thinking, wow, this is why I'm a coffee drinker. Because there's those great cups of coffee. And one comes along that goes, woo, smacks you across the face and goes, ah, that's what I've been waiting for. That's the, that's the flavor. And so, so I, I, think, I think the question's a good question because it means that we're honoring the craft. And we should do everything that we can with, with, with excellence, really. I had a similar experience with an Ethiopian. Um, it was literally like drinking blackcurrant juice. It was incredible. Um, so I would, I would advocate experiment with your coffee, try different brew methods. You don't have to have milk with it or sugar at all. It's delicious black if you get the right coffees and you brew it correctly. And that's where you really get the flavors of the soil. Um, like uh, just the way that Abdul Rahman just described, you get the flavors of the country in its raw state if you drink your coffee black and, and brew it correctly. So my final word on that is respect the, respect the bean. Fab. Now, Lazarus, you were saying people are only just starting to drink coffee, but is there a preferred way of having it or a way that you would recommend? I think uh, uh, surely, uh, generally speaking, I am I'm an amateur in this coffee, coffee thing. We are powered by, by nature and somehow I think we couldn't find a reason why coffee was that <laughs> thing. But generally after tasting coffee, now I'm addicted to it. So the, the, the way I, I, um, I prepare my coffee is... Uh, because I am at the source, so usually I have it fresh and medium roast. So usually I pick from the bag and put in, in my cup of coffee and pour in. Uh, like the, the Abdurrahman and Gordon have, have uh, stated, I pour in the water and then feel the flavors. Actually, uh, my children call it the sweet flavor. So... I, I just feel the flavors and yeah, basically that. And sometimes I get drunk a little. So, so I, I think the best, like <laughs> the, the best is to just experiment. The more you experiment, the better you get to, 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 to learn and get to appreciate. But most importantly, I, I think um, getting uh, fresh, fresh uh, roasts is much better than getting uh, commercial grade. You, you will get a better feel when you will get fresh ground or fresh roast or fresh coffee um, than the commercial type. That's that's uh, especially this. Uh, uh, they call it. Uh, just forgotten the commercial the commercial word, but surely, if you got from Gordon, probably you would get it much better. And you feel the soils and the freshness of the coffee. Thank you, Lazarus. That's brilliant. Yes. <laughs> so um, we are coming very close to the end. Um, and I'd like to say I'm going to do, do a few little updates before I ask the final question of everyone. So we've put in the um, chat box some contacts and websites um, that you might want to. You can hear more from Abdul Khreman wherever you get your podcasts from on This Being Human. Um, and Lazarus's Coffee is currently part of a business to business initiative um, who are hoping to bring their coffee to the UK. Um, here in Wales, um, Gordon says that Coal Town have got coffee available from Mount Elgon, as well as a variety of other places. We also have Jennifer's Coffee, which is from Mount Elgon as well, which is available here in Wales. Um, and uh, Jennifer has been to visit us in Wales, so many of you may have met her previously. Um, and, your cult and that's available online, as well as all of Coal Town's coffees are all available online. 
So we're coming to the end now. Sorry for the questions we couldn't get around to. I've got one last question for each of you. If you could try and keep them brief, because this is one that um, it's a big question. <laughs> That's why. Um, so in conclusion, what is a fear and hope that you have for the future? Um, coffee related. Uh, I will go around in order of those that spoke. So I'm going to start with Abdul Rahman. I, th I think Lazarus has given us a really stark and, 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 and vital picture, isn't it, of, of, of where we're at vis-a-vis -vis the climate catastrophe and emergency. And I think if anything, it is, a, it is a clarion call to action for all of us. And coffee being such an important cash crop means that we need to be putting pressure on our governments to make sure that the conversations about coffee are part of the broader economic conversations about climate change. And also to recognize that there are governments and, that, that, and, and societies which, you know, which actively support the exploitation of coffee, of coffee workers and coffee plantations. And I think about the way in which Saudi and Amarati companies buy up, say, coffee in the Yemen, right? Uh, at at, at uh, literally loan money to farmers to buy coffee at the lowest prices and then find themselves in a constant state of debt. There, there are so many practices that are absolutely, you know, reprehensible. And, and, and to suggest that that economic imbalance and that economic exploitation doesn't connect to the climate catastrophe would be, would, would, would be silly. I think that's really important. And what I'm hopeful for is that folks like Lazarus Gordon and, and the specialty coffee industry and, and others are, are really doing an amazing job by creating this kind of growing new economy uh, of, uh, of, uh, of coffee. And I think it's really important for us as consumers to really, really, really um, push this through the decisions that we make. Thank you. And Lazarus, a hope um, and fear for the future. Okay, yeah, I think uh, to, to if I would begin with uh, fear, the, at the moment, one of the greatest fear I have is um, uh, the fact that somehow uh, certifications are starting to be so much regulated, but also commercialized. And yet these certifications do not necessarily come with the money. They only come with the message. And I believe in this message. Sustainability, fairness, and protection of the environment. The cost of being certified is not the easiest that a producer group can manage without usually external funding. But also we are starting to see restrictions, uh, especially on entry into certification. And I think that's a, a something we need to raise our voices to so that the, those that are managing these offices should understand who they were, are working for and who should be making the voice of what it should be. And generally speaking, all certifications promote environmental protection and they promote sustainability. But I think when they start to put so many regulations to the entry, so many entry barriers, that is a fear. And surely probably then we will see more farmers being exploited, but generally then we will see more farmers running away from the crop. Because uh, like Abdurrahman had already stated, there is a history, which is a painful history associated with these commercial crops. For example, in Uganda, there's a, a type of coffee that is called chiboko. Chiboko in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Kiswahili or local term means a cane. So some of the, the establishment of the coffee plantations was as a result of uh, being cane to produce the crop. So there is something that is associated with it, but generally speaking, the hope is there. Uh, the good thing is that internet has burst so many of these things. Now I can access a buyer in UK. Now I can access a buyer in the US and we can talk face to face like we are talking today. The farmers are starting to realize that quality is key 
they are starting to realize that coffee is, a is food. And so the conversation should continue. If the conversation goes on, surely we all stand to benefit. The producer will benefit and the consumer will benefit from the good quality. And probably the trader will surely benefit from that. So it's going to be a win-win. And the economies will surely benefit from it. Because as Uganda now, there is a roadmap to coffee. We've seen there is more money coming in. But also we know that uh, the countries where this coffee ends up, there is a value chain, a whole chain of people who are employed along the value chain. So it's a win-win for all. The hope is there. More farmers are taking on to growing coffee. And surely the future is bright for the farmer, especially for if I would speak on the part of Uganda, the future is bright for the Ugandan farmer who is growing coffee, much better than the time I was born and raised on the coffee farm. Thank you, Lazarus. That's brilliant. Thank you to everyone for coming. I know a few people are having to leave because we're slightly running over. And Gordon, hope and a fear. Okay, my biggest fear, obviously, it has to be the climate, the climate um, discussion that's going on, and the you know the the urgency that uh, is attached to it, obviously, and the impact, which is very very tangible in in Lazarus's uh, presentation. Um, we have to address that. I mean, it's it's terrible the way that um, you know people's lives have been threatened, uh, communities have been threatened, and it's, it, now is the time that we have to take action on this. Um, so that's that's my biggest fear that we that we haven't run out of time, <laughs> um, that there is still enough time left for us to do something about it. But what I think is really positive is 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 just this kind of thing that we're doing tonight. It's just the the ability to communicate globally and share ideas and and, and have you know meaningful discussions around the subject and, and come up with practical solutions i mean i wasn't aware until until lazarus did his presentation of you know how, how serious the impact of global warming is on just his local community and there's probably hundreds of communities like that across the world uh, who are really feeling the brunt of this this catastrophe at the moment so i think it's it's great that we can discuss things like this and and, and work together to to have an impact and do it as quickly as we can Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending and to our speakers. We hope everyone had a good time and that you look at your morning cuppa differently in future. <laughs> um, I'd like to give a big thank you to all the panellists. And it's not normally, you know, there are people clapping, I'm sure. <laughs> for coming today and sharing your knowledge and also to our partners the Welsh Muslim Cultural Foundation and Welcome for working together so hard on the event doing all of the planning that we've been doing um, and also for being in charge of all the the chat box and the Q&A because um, you're sort of our silent partners who are working really hard at the moment behind the scenes so um the event is being recorded. We will let you know when it's available to watch. As you've signed up, you should have been able to tick um, the different partners' newsletters. So if you have done so, we will get you signed up to those newsletters. And Diochem um, thank you for coming today. I hope everyone has a good evening. And for those further afield, a great day. 